Good evening, everybody. I'm David Eulen. I'm the books editor of Alta Journal, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the California Book Club. Uh, I want to introduce. I want to. Uh, I'm glad that you're all here. I want to introduce both the magazine and the book club for those of you who may not know about it. Alta is a quarterly print journal that also has a very active daily web presence. Um, focusing on California history and culture with a great um, emphasis on books. Uh, we're running uh, weekly book reviews online as well as various essays and stories and, and poetry in, 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 in the journal. And the California Book Club, which is a monthly um, book club focusing on the California canon and um, California literature, which is, um, I think, the most vibrant um, literature in the United States. Um, I want to begin by thanking and, and um, talking a little bit about our partners. We could not do this without our partners. Um, our partners include Book Passage, Books Inc., Book Soup, Bookshop, Diesel, a bookstore, Bookshop in West Portal, the California, I'm sorry, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Publish, Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Vroman's Bookstore, and Ziziva Magazine. Um, with their uh, assistance and support, we produce monthly events for the California Book Club and continuous content leading up to each club meeting. And this material is free, always free and available on the web. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, please do so. Don't miss essays from numerous contributors, reflections on and, um, and, and commentary related to tonight's work, uh, an excerpt of your house will pay and more. We do this for every book, every month in the book club. All of this is also included in our weekly California book club newsletter, which is also free. How do you support this work that we do, bringing in-depth articles, essays, and interviews with authors like Steph Cha to you on a regular basis? Well, a couple of possibilities. There is a sale for California Book Club members for just $50. You can get a year of Alta Journal, the California Book Club tote bag, um, a handy tote bag with Velcro and pockets, um, good for the beach, good for teaching, good for just bringing stuff around, groceries, fantastic. Um, and one of our upcoming California Book Club uh, books. It's a bargain. If you want more information, please check out altaonline.com slash tote and watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link. Um, or you can simply join Alta as a digital member for just $3 a month. Um, I'm really excited about this particular meeting or episode of the book club. Um, we will be, we'll be talking about uh, John Freeman, who I'll introduce in a moment, our host. We'll be interviewing Steph Cha uh, about her book, Your House Will Pay, which came out in 2019, which is not just a groundbreaking and transformative crime novel, although it is that as well. It is one of the most um, eloquent and important contemporary novels of Los Angeles. Uh, and, and this is, a, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic book. So I'm gonna get out of the way and introduce John Freeman, who's gonna take it from here and please enjoy the conversation, John. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of the California Book Club with Alta. It's my big pleasure to be here tonight. Last month marked the 30th anniversary of the LA uprising, the six days of protest and anger and rage and destruction and heartache that uh, swept across Los Angeles in the wake of the Rodney King riots. And this summer, there's been some think pieces and some conversations about what happened and how that's shaken out over time. But I often feel like the way that we could best understand what happened in the city would be to sit down with various families uh, and have conversations with ourselves or with each other. Because if you simply take an image of those five or six days and try to backtrack them towards the source of the anger, the frustration, you get very easy answers to the source of the problem. But if you talk to families all over across Los Angeles, Latinx families, Chinese American families, Black families, Caribbean families, Korean American families, you get a very more, much more complex picture of what those days meant. And Steph Cha in Your House Will Pay has finally given the city a novel as complex as that event and its aftermath. It tells the story of two families fatally entwined by those days. One who was grieving the loss of a daughter, the other was trying to start over in the valley. One African-American, one Korean-American, one with two 
two boys who've gone to prison as men and have come out after three years or 10. The other has raised their daughters in a very sheltered way, trying to keep them from the secrets of those times. Steph Cha is a remarkable writer in the first three books, uh, it, had she not written Your House Will Pay, she would have probably be, be fast on the road to rewriting LA crime fiction with Follow Her Home, Beware, Beware, and Dead Soon Enough, the three uh, mysteries in the Juniper Song series, which starts as kind of in dialogue to the lovely Walter Mosley and Raymond Chandler and ends with a, a novel that's very close to what we're talking about now, which is a, a novel about family and the ties that bind. But there's a huge leap between that very remarkable novel, Dead Soon Enough, and Your House Will Pay. And I think it has to do to some degree with just the complexity and density and depth of emotion that she is able to capture and the difference in how families react to trauma, how they live with the past, how they love one another, what their love languages are, and what they'll do to cover for each other when uh, something terrible happens. Because when it comes to crime and punishment, retribution can often end up in the wrong place, especially when you don't account for the fact that some people will stand in front of someone else's bullet. So with that, I would love to bring on Steph Cha to talk about this uh, extraordinary novel. And um, welcome, Steph. Hi, uh, thank you so much, John, for that really nice introduction. It's uh, my pleasure. Um, for those in the audience who are dialing in and who, who maybe weren't following the news as closely now, this does begin from an actual case, um, the, the, the murder of 15-year-old Natasha Harlins. Do you want to talk a little bit about that case and its relation to this book? You were probably around six at the time when, the, when this happened. Um, and I know you found out about it recently. Um, do you want to talk about maybe the atmosphere of that time within your family, um, given that you, you maybe didn't know about this case, but you, you knew tentacles of what was happening around you? Yeah, um, I was five in 1991 when uh, Latasha was killed, and I was six at the time of the uprising. And uh, I grew up in the valley, the San Fernando Valley, um, you know, and just kind of cut off from the stuff that was happening in Koreatown and South Central LA. Like that was not really part of my childhood or my universe. And, um, you know, so I kind of you know, I, I feel like um, I've gotten to know LA as an adult in a way that I didn't growing up uh, as a child in the suburbs, just because, you know, I'm able to kind of take myself around now. I meet people from, you know, from all over the city. And it's just, it's just different from being a child and uh, being a sheltered child. Um, and so I feel like by the time I graduated from high school and like left LA for a while, I, I knew about the riots like I knew that that was like a thing and I knew that there was some history of animosity between you know black and Korean Los Angeles um, but I didn't really have an in-depth understanding of any of that history so in that in, in a lot of ways you know Grace the character of Grace is informed by that ability to exist in a place and uh, you know with a ton of history and not just and just not necessarily engage with it um, and then I became a crime writer, you know, and um, I feel like a lot of my relationship with the city is informed by uh, by what I do, which is to seek out stories of of crime in these in the communities that I care about um, and in the city that I know. Um, and uh, I had been working on uh, I had been working on Dead Soon Enough, which is a book that deals pretty heavily with ideas of legacy and inheritance, the way that we kind of you know, uh, especially members of minority groups um, tend to identify with each other and um, and feel the complicity and feel the hurt of other members of the group. Um, and then I um, and then I heard an interview that um, that Professor Brenda Stevenson did on NPR on one of the local NPR stations. I think it was KPCC um, about the Latasha Harlan's murder. Um, and you know, I feel like I had heard you know, I feel like I've probably heard about this case before, you know, but in some vague way. And in, and I, this was the first time that I was really hearing um, like all of the facts of this really remarkable case, um, which, 
which was, um, you know, a 15 year old uh, black girl killed by a Korean shopkeeper who was then convicted of voluntary manslaughter and then uh, effectively had the sentence, um, was, was given a slap on the wrist. She never served any jail time. Um, and uh, because the judge felt sorry for her, it was an incredibly um, fraught case that was handed off to a brand new judge uh, because, you know, the other, the judges more experienced didn't want to touch it. Um, and it's seen by, you know, even Koreans as this massive miscarriage of justice um, and, um, and is also considered one of the reasons why Korean owned businesses were targeted uh, in the rioting that followed the, the 92 verdict, um, exonerating the, uh, acquitting the officers who beat Rodney King. Mm -hmm. So I remember just being thunderstruck by this story. I, you know, it's one of those things where I, I was home when I started listening to the interview, and but I sat in my car and like listened to the whole thing. And I think by the time I got out of the car, I knew I wanted to write about it because, um, and, and I've never had that experience before where I just knew that uh, I had that I had so much emotional unpacking to do that it was a, a book, but I kind of knew right away because, you know, it, it just, uh, I, I felt incredible anger about the case and about what happened to Latasha, as well as just an automatic feeling of guilt by association because I'm Korean, you know, and I, and I doing more research on Sun Jae Do, I realized that, you know, she had lived at some points in the Valley where I grew up. And I just kept thinking, you know, I probably know people who know her, you know, we've probably been in the same supermarkets, you know, same churches, like it's, it's not, it's not that big of community. Um, and and I just wanted to kind of tackle that feeling of, um, you know, just that messiness of uh, what do you do when this when this both touches you and is somewhere over there. Of course, I dramatized that by putting that in the immediate family, but you know, just that sense of that just that sense of community with a murderer, um, I think, is a large part of what made me want to write this book. Mm. Yeah, there's a. a a tremendous moment later in the book where Grace meets meets up with Sean, uh, the nephew, um, the cousin of the woman who's been murdered, uh, that who would have been Grace's age. And Grace doesn't, she finally has found out that her mother years ago has uh, sh shot a, a teenage girl, black girl in her own convenience store and has managed to start over her life, gotten off, uh, not gone to prison and kept the secret from Grace, although Grace's sister knows. And I, I guess I want to talk to you a little bit about crime fiction and secrets, because secrets are a big part of your your other books, and they sort of are part of the narrative mechanism by which it works. But in this book, secrets are they're operating differently. They're they're not just simply part of the plot. They're part of the portrait that you're making of separate togetherness. And I, I wonder if you can talk about how you can use those secrets to fill out the, the ways that communities can live completely side by side um, and yet deny their inter interconnectedness. Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, you know, my grandmother just uh, just passed away a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, Sorry. and I feel like when old people die, especially old people from, you know, other countries and, you know, where there is just where, especially when the cultural norms, you know, are steeped in shame and secrecy and, and, you know, people came from poor places. And I feel like, uh, you know, family secrets came tumbling out. And uh, I feel like this happens in a lot of families. Um, you know, and, and I, and as I was writing this book, uh, you know, one of the things I never thought about was like, oh, how could they possibly keep this secret from her? Because it felt so natural to me. Um, because I see the way that secrets work in families, you know, I've seen it on, in my own family, I've seen it in, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in my uh, husband's family. It's just the way that, um, you know, how like 23 and Me like blew up a lot of people's spots. Like, there's this, there's always this sense of like sometimes the things that are really important to you, um, you might be the last to know. Um, and I think that definitely can happen uh, by design within families. But also, you know, we know so little about. The people who are closest to us in a lot of ways. I mean, we, we can have things about them hidden from us, but think about how easy it is to not know things about people who are even one or two degrees separated from you, you know, and then the people you pass on the street, like, forget about it. You don't know anything about them. Uh, and so I do think that it takes 
a certain level of curiosity uh, to find out about other people like in, in, in any way, right? I mean, not even the secret stuff, even just the like, what is it like to be you? Um, you know, and that's something that, um, you know, something I really like about LA is how close we are to so many different kinds of people. You know, we have so many communities that exist on top of each other and, and that overlap and that do mingle together, but that are also like, you know, in, in also heavily segregated. Um, and then there are many, many sub communities and, uh, and, I, and that's something that's appealing to me. That's what makes LA worth writing about and uh, worth living in. Um, but it also means that like, you know, there are two sides to this. One is like, yes, you don't necessarily know that much about your neighbors. The other side is if you ask your neighbors a few questions, you'll learn a lot. You know, something I did in um, one of the ways I researched this book, because I actually don't really like research, um, is I just talked to people as I ran into them, you know. Um, so, for example, like I have a car guy who uh, who just like fixes my fixes my car when I ding it up. He's Korean American. Um, he's like he's like 10 to 15 years older than me. And I was just asking about his experience of the early 90s, you know, about of those six days in particular, because uh, yeah, I knew he lived here. And it turned out that like his best friend was the one Korean American who was like killed during the riding um, by friendly fire. And he was supposed to, he had wanted to go riding out with this friend and his mom stopped him. You know, it's just people have hold on to all these stories and, uh, you know, they're not even necessarily holding on to them tightly. Sometimes they're just asking for people to ask. Uh, sometimes they're just waiting for people to ask. But I think, uh, you know, something that I've learned by writing crime fiction is just, you know, how close all of this hurt and violence is to the surface for so many people, um, you know, and how it's just a part of part of our lives um, that, you know, is waiting to be uncovered. Mm. Um, I wonder if you could read a little bit from the book um, and, and sort of set the scene for us because uh, you've, you've got a lot of people's memories operating within this book sort of it's the book moves between 1991 and 2019 but um, you know maybe if, if you could start with a sort of scene from from the past yeah um, I have a short uh, section that I can read um, this is from um, Sean's point of view when he's when he's um, 14 years old. Um, and this is about this is about the actual uprising. It lasted six days, six days of fire, a judgment poured over the earth. Figaro Liquor Mart was gone and Frank's Liquor, Florence Liquor and Grocery, Empire Market and Jingle Bell Liquor too. Laundromats were destroyed, the machines jacked for coins. Dry cleaners looted, plenty of people grabbing the chance to take somebody else's clothes. Some places put up signs like lamb's blood on their doors. Black owned, they said, and they were passed over, sometimes. Terry's interiors got the torch and Rod Davis Firestone and the African Refugee Center. After a while, fire didn't discriminate. They called in the National Guard. 63 people were dead. Sean watched it all happen. When the law didn't come, the lawless spread out. There were bangers everywhere, bold because the police were gone and because they had a truce for once, their priorities shifted away from each other. When they started getting crews together to ride up into Koreatown, Sean went with them, riding in the back seat of Sparky's grandma's Ford Escort, not even bothering to lie to Aunt Sheila. Koreatown, it was where the Koreans were. Chung Ja Han's people, the people who believed and supported her, who thought Ava was Han's bad fortune, a thing that had happened to her, like a car crash or a storm. It made sense to him to take this outcry to Koreatown. They would bring this judgment to them, to her community, her family, to her. When it was over, everything had changed. Wherever he went, he saw the extent of the ruin, the cooled remnants of days of unchecked wrath. Where there had been buildings, there were now building frames like children's pictures scribbled in pencil, gray and blurred and skeletal on the verge of disintegration. Roll up doors defaced by graffiti and ash, the metal warped so they'd never close again. Rubble and trash littered the streets like fallen teeth, like dead skin, the rot of a ravaged body. The neighborhood looked like a war zone, a place like nowhere he'd ever seen outside of photographs, but he lived in it now, victim, civilian, soldier, insurgent. He was different, still changing, the core of him destabilized and reformed by the fire. 
He joined up with the Bering Cross Crips, Sparky vouching for him, saying he'd been through it, that he was stone cold for 14. Ray and Sparky and four other guys jumped him in at the parking lot of Trueway Baptist the week after the uprising, the church's pink stucco walls charred black all the way up to the steeple. They formed a circle around him, each of them locking eyes on him and nodding, starting the ritual. Ray came at him first, and they swung at each other like they had a dozen times before, landing a punch each before the other boys moved in in turn. He kept his fists up and gave them his best, and they knocked him down, each of them laying hands on him until he was on the ground. As he lay there taking hits, his muscles singing, the taste of blood in his throat, he gave himself over to the boys and the pain. How great it was, the controlled aggression of family, to know the hurt would never be more than he could stand. Thank you. I read in uh, Sarah Weinman's interview that you sort of, you, your impulse to begin this book was originally to sort of understand the kind of the Korean American experience, but obviously the book works in two tracks and it's some of the power comes from those juxtapositions of the mirroring of, of Grace realizing that her life would have moved in parallel to Ava's life of uh, Sean, you know, realizing that he's, he's got to step up just in the same way that Grace has to step up at the pharmacy and eventually has to learn to take care, you know, has to Google how to give a sponge bath uh, to her mother because it's, you know, things are, things are really bad after she gets shot. Um, I, 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 want, I wonder if you can talk about the difference between you know, research, researching your way into the Korean American experience versus researching your way into the, um, and, into the lives of Sean and Ray and uh, Ray's, Ray's aunt and, and that family um, and what sort of things you wanted to avoid and what you discovered as a novelist. Yeah, I mean, um, I wrote three books that all had the same point of view character, you know, and she was a she's Juniper Song is a, you know, 20 something Korean American woman. Grace is a 20 something Korean American woman. That's somebody I've been, you know, um, and Grace is very different from me, but she is also a version of, you know, I kind of imagine both Grace and Miriam as like they have a piece of me in them that's more obvious than uh, the part of me that's in all of my other characters, you know. Um, but I think there was also something where uh, it was a lot easier to write them and it was a lot easier to write their family, even though their family doesn't actually look that much like mine, you know, the way that they operate, it's just very distinct um, from, uh, from the way that I grew up, you know, um, for example, like my parents speak fluent English, like that's like, it, 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 it just, this household sounds, looks and sounds different. Um, that said, uh, I, I knew people who, I, I know a lot of my friends are Korean American, grew up in uh, similarly, like, you know, first, first, second generation mixed homes. And, um, and so I know that kind of dynamic between the immigrant parents and the, and the children of immigrants, you know, that's something that I'm very familiar with, you know, from personal experience and from observing it in, in my friends' families. Um, I know that community, I, you know, the places in Northridge, um, that, that kind of, um, make up the landscape of the Park family's life. Like, I know, I know those places, like, I, 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 I got my haircut in Northridge today, you know, uh, it's, it, I, so I was, I had a level of familiarity with, um, the Park family's world, um, that I just didn't have with the Matthews Holloway family. Um, and I also, I also did know that, like, you know, even if I got some stuff wrong about, um, about, like, the Korean family, that I wasn't really going to be held to task for it, uh, you know, because I'm Korean. Uh, I think that is, <laughs> that does hold up as a defense in the way. Um, and so when I started writing this book, uh, it started actually as a, a short story for uh, this anthology of Asian pulp. Um, and it was really just about these two sisters having this conversation about a mother who did something really terrible in the 90s. Um, and when I decided that I thought there was a book in it, I realized that I was going to have to bring in the other family, uh, the Black family. And, um, and, you know, I thought about whether this was a good idea, you know. Uh, and then I decided that I couldn't do it without without having that kind of split point of view, you know. And I think the reason for that is that, uh, you know, you know, we're all fiction readers here. That's the power of fiction is it puts you on the shoulder of whoever's speaking, and whatever whatever 
relationship the author has with those characters, you're going to empathize with, you're going to empathize with the person whose point of view you're in. You're going to understand them in a way that you just can't understand the people that they come across. Um, it's not, the, it's not demanded of you. Um, and so I felt that as a non-Black writer, writing those characters um, as side characters without entering a POV, while I was, while I was giving my full attention to the feelings and emotional state of, uh, of a member of the Korean family, I just felt like the only thing that I would end up doing was like f to flatten those characters into kind of perfect victims, which is just not what I wanted to do with this book. It's one of the things that the book writes against, which is that, um, which is that we require, you know, any, any kind, any level of, um, you know, perfection or innocence um, from people who are killed, um, you know, with, with, through no fault of their own, right? Um, and so I wanted to write against that. And in order to do that, I felt like I had to kind of really get in there um, and show like fully developed characters. Um, it was a lot harder to do that with, with Sean than it was with Grace. Um, I remember kind of um, the first two and a half years of writing this book was just figuring out the first third of it kind of nailing down Sean's voice, his family dynamics. Um, early draft, I remember one of the best and harshest notes I got was from my husband who read it and said, uh, Grace feels like someone you know, and Sean feels like someone you read about. You know, because I did all this kind of, you know, sociological research, I talked about, I, I read about, you know, Black Los Angeles, kind of the history of like, of migration to LA from other parts, you know, just all this stuff that's not really about like, the things that we want to read about. And so it just took more digging to get into his his character. And the book wasn't done until I felt like the two sides were pretty even. Um, you know, what I did learn um, is that uh, it's possible, you know, to kind of to kind of even that out. It just takes a lot of work. Um, and I also found, you know, that I I thought it was I thought it was a good thing that throughout this whole process I was constantly I was constantly a little bit terrified that I would do a bad job because I think uh, doing a bad job in um, when you're when you're writing the other when you're writing across race when you're writing across identity is that you can harm you can harm an entire group of people you know and um, and so I think that um, you know authors should should approach that that responsibility with like a great deal of care and trepidation you know I think. Uh, um, you know, we're all afraid of writing bad sentences, uh, but like fewer people notice that. I think we should all be afraid of uh, writing things that do harm to others. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, I think there is something positive to be said about um, being thoughtful in uh, what we write and what we say. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I think the self-editing um, and the kind of work that went into writing these these this family um I learned a lot from <laughs> I don't know that I'd do it again um at least not right away because I don't know if I want to write and I spend another five years writing my next book but uh it was definitely a learning experience well it was, you've done it so beautifully and I think in part because you don't see the characters from the outside uh th there's there's great stretches of interior life in this book um and one of the ways you build interior life to me seems to be through people's work and their bodies and, and what they carry in their bodies. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, because I, I want to bring in Todd Goldberg, the, the, the novelist and writer um, who's going to ask you some questions. He's the author of, of Living Dead Girl, which was an LA Times book prize finalist in the mystery category, but also the popular Burn Notice series. Todd, are you still here? Um, you want to come on and ask some questions? I would never leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see uh, everyone in the audience and great to see my friend Steph, who I haven't seen in a good long time. Yeah. Um, I have to embarrass Steph a little bit by telling you how much I absolutely love this book. I think Steph's book is maybe one of the best crime novels of the last 25 years. Um, I know we're talking about it in terms of its impact in California and its impact as an LA crime novel. Um, but I think what you've done, Steph, is going to change the way crime fiction is written for a very long time, irrespective of whether or not anyone's ever been to Palmdale. Um, so um, I'm I'm a number one fan of this book and of and of you and, and your work in general. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've got a couple hard hitting questions. Are you ready? All right. 
<laughs> well, first, so here, here's the most important thing. I reread the book this weekend, and and this is something people I haven't talked about yet today. What is your favorite food that you talk about in the book? Because I reread the book and I was starving for food <laughs> afterward. Um, I think there's kimchi jjigae in there. That was the yes. food that uh, it's like a pretty basic uh, Korean staple. Um, and it's the food that I craved the most when I went to college or <laughs> whenever I came home. She makes it with spam. It's really, really good. <laughs> people, don't, people don't understand that spam spam is the key to uh, to artists and foods. Oh, um, the way that um, spam soaks up soup is like <laughs> it, it's incredible. Like, uh, and and it's like the spam and like the kind of the kind of like spicy soup base that is right. like you know in a lot of like Korean foods, um, it, they just, they just go together so well. You, the, I just saw the stock market spam just went up 20 points. You are moving product <laughs> tonight, Steph. Um, you know, the thing that I'm, I was most fascinated by when I read your book initially in 2019. And the thing that I think I'm already seeing the effect of from your book is that you wrote a crime novel that really is about a failure of the criminal justice system. And, and you wrote a crime novel without really any cops in it. You know, there, there's a couple of scenes with the detective, um, but by and large, this is a crime novel about, about the people who, who perpetuate crime, of course, and the victims of it, but where the police are sidelined. Was that, was that intentional or is that just because of the kind of story you were telling? It was both intentional and not. Like there was a moment after I finish it or was almost all the way done with it where I realized that um that I had um I have like two white guys in this story that have that are oh no no I guess there are three but there's the detective and there's the journalist and mm -hmm. I realized that in a different version of this book which I might have written you know because like my first three books were in that investigative mode you know Grace and Sean would be like the characters that you meet for like a chapter because right investigator the investigator goes out and talks to them and then leaves right um and so I have these two characters who could have been the leads um who are kind of relegated to these side positions so I think about it as kind of a inverted crime novel you know it, mm -hmm. it's telling a similar story um you know because there's a version of this that could be pure investigation um but it's focusing on um on the people who don't, don't who don't really have the tools to like right figure out like what happened and on their own and where like figuring out what happened is not really as important as like, you know, what actually did happen. Uh, uh, and I think, um, and I knew from the beginning that I wanted to tell this story through these, these characters or at least characters like them who are like affected by the crime, um, you know, and, um, and I think that what I wanted to do um, was just like spend time you know, because we read about all these horrible stories like all the time and um, and then we stop thinking about them, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody's killed somewhere else and then we think, oh, how, how terrible. And then, you know, a year later, five years later, 30 years later, you know, that, that family's still out there and that's still kind of the defining, you know, one of the defining facts of their life, right? And so I wanted to kind of um, have a story where you like had to sit with had to sit with these people as they, as they um, kind of absorbed this history and, uh, and just like lived with it. And uh, you know, what, what that means and what that looks like kind of day to day. Well, and it's interesting because I think about um, the sort of victim forward crime fiction is something I'm seeing a lot more of lately. And, and, and I think probably you're because of you. Um, but you know, you, you I don't think I don't think enough people. <laughs> maybe maybe not directly, <laughs> but who's going to stop us from saying it's true? Um, but you know, like um, from from contemporaries too, like your friend Ivy Pakoda's these women, or a novel I just read called um, Notes on Execution by Daniel Kukovka, which is really really great, which puts the crime like the crime's front and center, obviously. But the actual dramatic exploration is about the victims or more often like it is in your book about the, the ripples out from the victims, the trauma that happens to the third party, the, in your case, the children or the cousins or, or whatever. 
And that seems to me to be culturally where we, the real issue of what, what happens with crime really is going. It's not just the dead body, it's the person that has to deal with the, the dead body 20 years later. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe maybe that's also aligning with kind of, um, you know, changing attitudes towards law enforcement, you know, over the last several years, mm -hmm. um, the complications of cop narratives. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that's certainly true. I mean, I think, um, you know, another thing that I was reacting to as I started writing this book was just, you know, the connection between 30 years ago and uh, kind of the rise of like the early days of the Black Lives Matter movement. Because mm. uh, you know, I started writing this at like the end of 2014. I was thinking about, you know, Latasha Harlan's to, Mar to, to Mike Brown, you know, that kind of, th 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 that kind of in between. And when you're, when you're looking at these stories of, um, of, you know, victims of police violence, um, you know, they're often young, they're often black. Uh, and, and, and it's hard not to see, uh, all those families, you know, um, just the, just the like moms who have to keep getting up on the podium and talking about how good their kids were. I mean, it's just like, right. it's just absolutely wrecking. Um, and I think like all of us who kind of pay attention to the news cycle, um, you know, we've now like seen so many of these stories. Um, and we, and, and I think also true crime, you know, for like, there's a, there's a whole other conversation to have about true crime, but like one of the things it has done is kind of given some more context and, uh, you know, to like the um, people who are affected by these tragedies, right? By these, mm -hmm. by these horrific crimes. Um, and so maybe, maybe as a culture, we are kind of um, being trained to pay more attention to the victim side now. Mm -hmm. I mean, which I think is a good thing. Um, it certainly makes it so that there are, um, more kind of uh, entry points um, for these stories. Right. And I think, too, the thing that true crime does and, and the way that sort of plays in, in, in your book, obviously, is that, you know, in effect, Grace becomes the investigator in this. Um, and so I think true crime has kind of deputized all of us to go out there and solve crimes, whereas it used to be That's if if you read like a cozy <laughs> crime novel, it was only the caterers that got to solve the crimes. Now all of us are, are allowed to go out there and, 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 and solve the crimes. I don't advocate it, but uh, <laughs> maybe sometimes we need it. Um, so my last question for you, and then um, I'll, let, I'll let John come back. We, we'll see if we'll let him turn his camera on, um, is I'm wondering now, uh, as you approach the next part of your career, um, you've written a novel that is, has been hailed as, it was hailed like immediately, the day that it came out, it was already hailed as one of the 20 best LA crime novels ever written. Um, how do you deal artistically with that kind of pressure? Um, well, uh, that's a great question. I haven't started writing another book. That's why. <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> Go the Harper Lee route. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, Okay, so when the book came out, um, it like it's it 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 was like a different level of attention than I'd gotten for the Juniper Song books, which right. is really great because nobody read those books. <laughs> 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 but um, no, but I but I realized that like, look, I'm like I'm in my thirties. I'm not gonna like retire off this book. Like that's not gonna happen. Like I'm gonna write more books just because like it's a thing that I have to do. Right. Um, and. I realized, you know, I'm not going to replicate this book. I, for one thing, I don't want to be the Asian American author who is like a mouthpiece for like strife between the Black and Asian communities. Like, I'm not interested in doing that. Um, you know, I, I, I will always write about LA. I will always write about kind of the way that communities inter intersect in LA. But I think that this was kind of uniquely like, um, I don't know, saleable because of the particular po political dynamic within it. And I realized, you know, whatever I write next is probably not going to have that, you know? Um, and, um, but, but I think it will still be um, worth writing. Uh, I, I haven't, the reasons that I haven't started writing it are more related to, um, you know, I entered the pandemic very pregnant and then now I'm very pregnant again. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's more that I'm kind so we of know what you were doing during the pandemic. <laughs> I'm just in these kind of baby years, you know, right. um, which is actually like it's it's been nice because I feel like uh, 
I've, your household pay has had a pleasantly long tail where I still get to do stuff like this, you know, after a couple of years. And, um, you know, I'm, I've been working in TV, which is, um, you know, it's like more relaxing in a way than writing a book. Um, mm-hmm. It's like more other people's responsibility to do things. And, people bring you food. Yeah, That's yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, the idea of writing a novel, again, is very daunting to me. So I haven't like overcome that yet. But I think it has less to do with, um, you know, the reception of your household pay and more to do with just the fact that the farther you get away from the beginning of a novel, the more it seems like, oh, how did I ever? Right. Well, if it helps you, I have a book due in, uh, in 65 days. And so if you just wanted to pop in and write a couple (laughs) hundred thousand words for me, I would deeply appreciate it. (laughs) Well, thank you uh, for letting me chat with you a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell John. You can come back, John, from wherever you are. Yeah. Is he somewhere in there? I'm somewhere in the vortex. <laughs> right, and I'm gonna disappear. Right. That I was disappear. fantastic, Todd. Thank you so thank much you for course. putting this in the context of, of the kind of breakthroughs that are in the novel. Um, but also just how Steph, you've, you've altered the form of what crime fiction is. And, and one thing that, you know, the the framer, the typical framers of debate uh, of what a crime is in this, you know, the police, the, the, the person who's writing a kind of true crime story, the media, they get this wrong um, throughout the, the, the novel. Um, and you sort of allow the characters to frame the, the events um, for themselves. And I think one of the things that the book is best about is just, it's not so much um, vengeance, although that's a big part of it, um, it's, it's the yearning for forgiveness and how people yearn in different ways and they seek it out in different ways. And I, I guess um, it connects to a question that one of the audience members, Nicholas Hernandez asks. Um, it's just, he says, one of the most impactful moments in the book was Grace's apology to Sean. She apologized not for something that she did obviously, but rather her family's actions. He asks, how do you think this enlightens the culpability of individuals for their family's actions and more broadly, for what individuals perceive to be their community's actions. Yeah, um, you know, that scene, um, that was one of the scenes that I knew kind of at the beginning of the book uh, was going to be important. And I knew I was going to end the second section with that. Um, Yeah, Grace goes about the, you know, she kind of goes about um, this in a very clumsy way where she just wants absolution. Um, and, you know, Grace in a lot of ways is a stand-in, not just for kind of the uh, guilt of Korean American, you know, children of immigrants, although certainly that uh, certainly there is that dynamic. But, you know, I think um, a lot of Americans um, have to reckon with, um, with the guilt that we feel about our particular inheritance. You know, um, we live in a country that that is prosperous for a lot of really bad reasons. Um, you know, we have we have centuries of uh, of slavery that we are still trying to figure out uh, how to deal with and uh, and whether to deal with it at all. You know, and I think that uh, you know, and I and, and you know, I think that that's part of being American is figuring out what your relationship is with with that guilt, with that inheritance, um, with that hurt, um, and so you know, so that's something that both both families are going through, you know, where there has been this horrible crime and one side has to figure out, okay, I'm related to the perpetrators, like, what do I do? And one side is related to the victims. And the, the question there is more like, okay, how do I, how do I like deal with the fact that like, I'm not in charge of any of this, you know, I don't have control of this narrative. Um, and so, you know, that apology, you know, I think that, I think there is this kind of knee jerk desire um, on the part of um, any of us who have ever felt this level of guilt um, to kind of be absolved, you know, to, uh, and I think like black forgiveness has a particular, uh, particular currency, um, particularly within liberal progressive circles. And, 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 and I think that's kind of the wrong way to go about it. And it, and it kind of leads to a, a lot of, um, discomfort that isn't necessarily productive. Um, whereas I think that what, um, what we actually need is like more genuine, deeper engagement, you know, because forgiveness is like an easy thing to ask for, but like, what are you really asking for? You know, because I think like there is almost 
this, this assumption in asking for forgiveness that like you're being blamed for the things that like your ancestors have done. And that's almost never true. Um, and um, so I think that's kind of th that, I think that conversation around forgiveness is always just, you know, we need to think about what that means. We need to think about like what we actually want and need to like move on and to kind of be, you know, moral citizens, people who are able to exist with each other. Um, you know, because it's not as simple as like, like there is this great weight I'm carrying around, you can take it off of me. You know, I think there's something about like living together that is a lot messier than that. Mm. This connects to a question that uh, another, another audience member, Linda Vasu, had, which is about inter intergenerational trauma and resilience. And I think it, maybe it might be helpful to tie this to, together to the fact that in the book, um, absolution and other forms of forgiveness are being um, solicited and edged towards within the families as well. Um, in the course of Grace's mother being shot going into a coma, getting better. She realizes that in talking to her mother that uh, her first years in Los Angeles were deeply difficult. Um, reg regardless of the ways that she describes it, it was very dangerous for her as a shopkeeper. Um, she was terrified. Uh, and in this bathtub scene later on, it, it feels like it's one of Grace's ways of apologizing to her is to sort of care for her in, in this in this way that, you know, it's it's very different from going into the a, a bath a, a Korean bath with her, where she's just sort of everyone's naked. It's this is this is something tender, more tender and more hands on. And I, I wonder if in that scene you're, if you're dealing with that sort of symbolically at all, or if, if it's just simply that, the kind of thing a, um, a child would do for their parent. Yeah, that scene um, was was one that um th that's a pretty important scene in the book um and uh you know just the um I think that kids don't really want to know their parents in a lot of ways we benefit from not knowing our parents I think uh I you know I think uh we get used to um not seeing them as like whole people who existed before we came along right because we're little and they attend to all our needs and we don't have to think about their needs. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and so, you know, Grace has, Grace thinks about her parents, you know, she's somebody, she loves her parents and, but she's not ever really like confronted what, with the realities of what life was like for them. And they, they also are not trying to like, you know, put that on her either. Um, and, and so that particular scene where her mother is like literally laid there laid naked before her, um, I think is, you know, it's, it's one that like, is, makes her extremely uncomfortable. Um, and it's a moment of bonding that is also pretty ugly. Um, and, um, and I think that's kind of, um, you know, the, 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 their relationship, I think like Grace resents her for complicating her life, um, you know, which is a very selfish thing, right? I mean, I think uh, Grace tells her that this is like the worst thing that's ever happened to her, where obviously it's like, you know, a far worse thing. This is a terrible thing to have happened yeah. to me. <laughs> but, you know, I think children are self-centered when it comes to their parents. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how we survive, right? Until adulthood is by expecting them to kind of be the sacrificing ones. Um, you know, but I, 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 the, the, I, the kind of impetus for this book was just this idea of like, you know, how we end up becoming corrupted by kind of compromising um, or, or not even compromising, but kind of finding the balance of like what our values in a vacuum look like and what that looks like when you bring in other people, um, you know, and, you know, I think uh, Grace and Miriam have this conversation, but, you know, if like, if someone in your, if, if one of your loved ones goes off and like does something evil, like good luck, not getting evil. Like, it's just, it's just, we have, it's very human to kind of sympathize with you know, the people you love and the people you owe things to. Um, and so I think a lot of the, um, a lot of what's happening in this book is just that negotiation um, of finding like kind of who you are in relationship to, in relation to your family. What does that mean for justice? Um, Gerald Sato has a question about justice, you know, basically a violent act of retribution is committed against uh, Grace's mother. Um, but at the end, you know, the per I don't want to give away the ending, but it's it's not a, 
you know, th this is almost Shakespearean, you know, by the end of this, this novel where it, it it's, if justice has been achieved, it's been, it, it's, it's in only in, in the attempt, or do you believe that justice is, is not achievable? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that justice is achievable in the abstract, I certainly do. Um, however, I think when, um, when there is a massive miscarriage of justice, it's hard to make that up. Um, and, um, and I think that especially when, um, you know, when the state fails, like, like we all like subject, sub, subject ourselves to government so that we can be safer. And because there's supposed to be this, you know, objective system that serves all and kind of keeps the balances correct. And, you know, we just know that that's not true. And when that isn't true, then everything else is extra legal and it becomes really murky and there are costs in acting your own justice. And, and, and so it becomes impossible for, um, it becomes a good outcome becomes impossible um, because the good outcome wasn't achieved in the first place and anything done to balance that out is going to come with extra costs. And so, you know, I think this is a very messy vision of justice. Um, I don't think anybody at the end of this book feels good about what's happened, you know, and, um, and it's, and there is that sense that like all of these, all of this toxicity kind of, goes from generation to generation. And, you know, I've seen this, I, I've seen this in like, um, and this is kind of what uh, my third book was about, kind of the, this, because I grew up in a Korean family, you know, who, I grew up hearing about the way that Japan keeps lying about things they did during world, in, during the occupation in World War II, right? And, you know, it's now it's like, it's been almost a hundred years since like, uh, since a lot of those events and, uh, you know, people still aren't over it, even though like all those people are dead. Um, I think that um, I think that these historical ills kind of become like baked into our bones and into our into our uh, generational memory, um, and then and then it's kind of impossible to erase it, you know. And so we just have to live with it and figure out what that means for us. Mm. Is that why there's there's among other things um, Todd alluded to it. This is a book full of food and ritual, and there are moments of of. I wouldn't say great happiness, but there are moments of joy and real communion in the middle of things pro getting progressively worse. You know, where, you know, the right, right as, uh, you know, Grace finds out exactly what's happened with her family. She's sitting down with her, you know, her uncle for food and the food is good. And, you know, it, are you saying something about the fact that, you know, that, that all we have are these messy outcomes, but we do have these perhaps ennobling rituals to keep us together in spite of them. Yeah, I think so. Because I think um, where there is hope in this book, because I think, you know, it's not a particularly hopeful book, is that, um, you know, all so all these people that I've been talking about, kind of the families of victims everywhere, you know, people who have had horrible, unimaginable things happen to them. Most of them are still alive, you know, which means they're alive today. They were alive yesterday. They were alive the day before that. They were alive a year before that. You know, and at some point it becomes hard to imagine them being miserable every second of every day of their lives, right? And I mean, I, I mean, I, we've had tragedies in my family. Actually, while I was writing Your House Will Pay, my 27-year-old cousin, uh, you know, stuck up a drug house and got and got shot and killed. Um, and my, I see my uncle and aunt and his sister like all the time. And you know, we don't talk about it every time. I kind of know that they're constantly in a state of you know, it's not like they've forgotten him, but they live their lives. You know, his sister, his sister got married this year. We went to the wedding and, and, and it's just the way that life moves on um, without these people being entirely forgotten. I, I, there's a, there's dignity and there's hope in that. Um, and I also, think also comfort, you know, there's a comfort yeah. in the dailiness that's in this book. Yeah. And it's just normal people like, being together and kind of, you know, one of the things that Sean deals with in this book is that his like nephew gets in a car crash, you know, like a minor fender bender and they like go to a Burger King and like talk it out. He, I think like we, all these kind of big catastrophic headlining things that happen um, are, are, they're really short events within the spans of like very long lives. Um, and so I think one of the things I wanted to look at was like, okay, how do, how do you 
this is an impossible thing. This is a horrible thing. You can't accept this thing. And yet by living another day, you, you kind of do, you accept it. And, you know, you absorb it into your reality and, you know, you just, you move on just by not being dead. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to look at, like that kind of rickety day by day. Um, and I think there is, there is some hope in that, just that, you know, all these people do find some kind of way. Mm. Well, it's a beautiful novel and a, a, a sort of dazzling act of, of temporal structural storytelling. Um, and I completely agree with Todd that it is, it is, um, it has written itself right into the, the canon. Um, and, uh, you know, I think talking to you is enlightening, but it's, it's also sobering in the sense that, um, you know, I was hoping you, you were going to be saying like, I'm almost done, like in that sort of montage way where it's like pulling the last page out of the typewriter, but, um, oh gosh, I wish. <laughs> I, it's, it's somehow, um, uh, it's somehow reassuring to, to realize how long a book of this quality takes. Um, and I hope another one comes because it is truly, um, truly a remarkable book. And I'm so glad that you could join us in the middle of your busy life. Um, and uh, Todd, thank you for coming in. You can Kramer us at any time. <laughs> um, I would love to see you in a variety of interesting shirts uh, with or without a cigar. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I guess, David, it's, now it's your turn to come back on. Um, Daniel Olivos had a, a question that just, which I th thought was really interesting. He wanted to connect this back to the, the Watts um, um, events of, 19, of the 1960s. Um, I think that might have to be for another time because it, it will take us into a, a whole other decade. Um, but uh, thank you, Steph, for, for joining us. Oh, thank you. And uh, on the on the Watts, uh, the Watts Rebellion, um, you all should read Nina Ravor's novel, Southland, if you haven't. Yes. That Big was part of our book club. Oh, yeah. OK. It's a wonderful book. Well, thanks. Um, that was a great discussion. It's nice to be on screen with all of you right now. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, thanks, Todd. Thanks, Steph. It's like, it's great to have um, not just people, my colleagues and writers I admire, but my friends here, and I'm delighted. Um, I want to let you all know that this interview is recorded and will be available at CaliforniaBookClub.com. Um, I also want to uh, let you all know that we will be back next week. Uh, uh, next week. I wish next week. We'll be back next month on Thursday, uh, July 21st first with Luis J. Rodriguez discussing his memoir, Always Running. Uh, another reminder about the sale on Alta membership for California Book Club members uh, at altaonline.com slash tote. Um, and or again, that $3 digital membership. Please participate in a two minute survey that will pop up as soon as we end the event. Um, stay safe. See you all next month. Take care. Happy reading.